My name is Jon Andersson, and I'm the product manager for Connected Open Heritage. Um, we, uh, together with my colleagues, Axel and Andrea, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what you and the rest of the Wikimedia movement can do together uh, to help preserve the cultural heritage of the world. So what we will focus on during this talk is a little bit about what has happened before and what we've learned from that. Um, some current things are happening right now um, around the uh, project called Connected Open Heritage. And we are thinking about how we can organize larger and better projects in for the future that are having a larger impact. Uh, so Axel here will start with a little bit of a background um, about what we have been doing so far in the movement, just to give kind of a feeling what, what, you know, what we learned from, what we learned from. Hi, Axel. I'm Glam coordinator for the Swedish chapter. Uh, working with Glam, it's the best thing because it's so many things you can do. It's not only one thing, it's, it's like um, you have a lot of components that, uh, that you can do. Uh, photo competitions, editathon workshops, uh, image uploads, content donation data sets. Uh, a lot of them are the same but uh, in different ways. A Wikipedian in residence, for instance, is in some places a volunteer doing volunteer work at a museum, doing workshops. In some places, someone being paid by the Glam Institution to, to edit articles uh, and uh, help doing things like uploading images or categorizing and do background work. Uh, in some places, like Italy, Wikilove's monuments is kind of a struggle. You have to clear the rights for, for the images or for every monument before you can take photos and share them. Uh, so, so it's not that easy to build up the database with all the things that you have to work with. Uh, in Sweden, we are getting lists that's pre-formatted and, and ready to put on Wikipedia to, to work with. So it's easier for us to, to, to work with that. Uh, volunteers have built up the lists in, in 56 countries, I think we said, so uh, it's it's been a great work, but uh, having the lists five years ago and then since then they haven't really been synchronized with the heritage board data, so, so they're kind of outdated, so we're not working with current data and, and we need to do something to solve that also. Uh, batch uploads, for instance, can be either done by a volunteer by the GLAM institution themselves with help from volunteers. There are actually some GLAMs that's good enough to do uploads themselves without help from volunteers. They're maybe asking some questions every now and then. Uh, and uh, working together with other GLAM institutions can be either small collaborations like a workshop or nothing more. It tends after one thing we do together. It can be a long standing collaboration where we do projects over time, we keep working together for several years, and even in some cases the collaboration ends because the GLAM institution becomes so good at doing wiki stuff themselves, so we don't really have to help them anymore. They just keep doing editing and uploading images and working by themselves instead, so, so it's not really a co collaboration anymore. Uh, partnerships works in, in various ways. It could be short term and long term. Uh, either the GLAM institution can come to a volunteer and say, I need help with this, someone editing in their field. They can come to a chapter if there's a chapter in the country or in the region, or it could be the other way. We go to a museum and say, hey, we can do this together, we can work together. A volunteer can go to a museum and say, I'm really interested in your stuff. Can you release some images? Can I borrow books from your museum library to, to find some good sources? Um, and they can also be with GAMs of all sizes, everything from the tiniest small museums with no staff and only volunteers, up to the national libraries and archives and uh, national museums in, in countries and cities we're working with. Uh, it can be content donation data sets, it can be editing and doing things like that together. Um, we're also working with companies in some cases because they have their historical archives, so it's not only GLAM institution, but it's also companies or government bodies that have data sets on, on things that we're interested with and want to put up on, on Commons also or on Wikidata. Partners in some projects can also be the funding body if it's an external funded project. Uh, 
for, for this Connected Open Heritage project, uh, the Postcode Lottery, it's, uh, the Postcode Lottery has helped redesigning the, the project in order to be a better project and they can also in some ways suggest other partners to, to build a stronger bid or they can uh, uh, say, well, we have this other application from another organization that's in your field, maybe you should write an application together instead of doing it just by yourself. Uh, and um, previously our projects has usually involved one or two partners and not doing that many things, only small things, but we're trying to do it in this project to work with many partners and a lot of different things because the more partners and the more things we can do at once, we don't have the same amount of overhead and the same amount of uh, of the boring coordination stuff, but rather more of the funny uploading and editing and, and doing that kind of stuff. Uh, in a partnership, it's so not, not only working with them, it's, it's a giving and taking, and the best thing is that it's both giving and taking and not only a while back it was more like, so you have a really nice collection of images there that it's public domain, so we're going to take it and put it on commons. We don't really need to talk to you because we just want the images. Uh, I, I think and hope we have moved away from that and are now more working together. You have some nice images. We want to give them more visibility. We can help you put them up on commons and, and help you edit uh, pages to, to put the images in there and, and uh, do backlinking so you can have traffic back to your database and then visibility. So not only one way. Uh, some collaborations are also not only things coming to Wikidata or Commons. It's, uh, for instance, a museum wanting to use images, so they start looking Commons and, and we might help them with categories and where to look for images. And, and they're only using images. It's a one-way collaboration, but not into the Wikimedia movement, but rather the other way around. Uh, the best collaborations, on the other hand, is the one where it's not only a win-win situation, but in one case uh, in Sweden, from uh, we got a list of uh, working life museums to, to put on uh, Wikipedia, and the coordinates for where the museums were were in all different formats. It was about 1,500 museums on uh, on the list, and it was impossible to use. So, so handing it to Andre, he did some magic to it, and all of a sudden, all the coordinates were of the same format. So. Uh, it was easy to put it on Wikipedia and having already done the lists like in one format, we could give it back to the Council of Working Life Museums and all of a sudden they could put a map with all the museums on their website as well. So, so not only did Wikipedia benefit from it, they also had good use from it and all people interested in visiting Working Life Museums could find them on the map, which they hadn't been able to do before. And uh, with that, I'm handing the microphone back to John. Yeah, so, stay, stay, stay. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so through this project, the Connected Over Heritage, uh, we want to bring together all these. Can you hear me? Bring together all these lessons learned. Um, and we, what we are trying to do with this project is, you know, building a much, much bigger project that combines all these different parts that we've been experiencing and trying with um, as a movement for the last few years. Um, but we're also trying to broaden the scope a little bit because, you know, most chapters have been working, you know, locally. They are trying to do national stuff. As we heard in the last presentation, there hasn't been much coordination with tools and other, other things. Um, and that has led to the fact that, I mean, a lot of, of countries in the world is underrepresented when it comes to the cultural heritage online. Um, because there hasn't been, you know, any volunteers that are working with it. Uh, so what we're trying with this Connected Open Heritage project is to solve some of that problem. Uh, we want to take and help you know, user groups and, and volunteers in, in countries where the cultural heritage is at most at risk. So you know, where the cultural heritage is in danger because of uh, you know, people destroying it or because of uh, national catastrophes or that kind of things. And uh, as a mid-sized chapter, I mean, we do have, we have some technical in-house expertise that can do some of the problem solving that is hard for like, a small user group that are completely dependent on volunteers. And through this project, we've actually been, you know, it's been possible for us to rehire uh, staff members that can, you know, now train and develop their skills. So we will have more people that can support other chapters as well. 
And uh, we started this project now here in 2016, so it's pretty new. Um, but we're going to continue it for a full 18 months. So it's going to be in the middle of uh, 2017 when we hope to be f f uh, finalizing this. And it's an externally funded project by the Swedish uh, Postcard Lottery, Cultural Fund, Fund the, Sw the Culture Foundation of the Swedish Postcard Lottery. Um, and uh, they have been uh, giving us a very big grant of 300,000 uh, US dollars. And um, you know this because they think that this product has the potential to have a, like a very high impact on the culture of the world um, and help with the preservation. So and uh, we have a we we designed the product so it would be very technologically oriented um, and we're trying to do a lot of work with um, establishing standards, documenting stuff, um, you know, doing things that are you know so the technical side becomes more solid um, and easier to use for other people as well. And uh, for us, I mean, as an organization, we strongly believe that it's really, really important that the chapters uh, start working more together, that there is more exchange in the movement, and uh, that, you know, this digitization process globally really, ne you know, we need to coordinate stuff uh, because collections are spread out all over the world. I mean, there are museums from other countries that have, you know, museums in, in your country might have collections from my country uh, because it was stolen, it was, uh, they had an exhibition, you know, all these kind of things. Um, and you know, bring it online. You can kind of connect everything, and that's why we have the name Connected Open Heritage. Um, you know, and, and really link them together and make them more usable. Um, learn more from it, and so on. Um, and uh, we also know that there is the discussion. I mean, the the quality of the discussion in different countries are so different. Uh, so I mean, the the discussions about how to digitize collections has gone pretty far in some countries. I mean, the you know governments have thought about it really. Well, in some countries, they haven't really started yet. And we think there is a possibility here to you know, jumpstart discussions, because now we have the possibility of organizing events in those countries, pre preparing all the material that is needed, um, and you know, like, in general, like, build up the, like, the knowledge base that is needed to you know, kickstart things in, in new communities. And we're doing this project together with a bunch of organizations that are really helpful in, you know, for this type of task. So we have, first of all, UNESCO. Um, and we have John Cummings, who's a Wikipedia resident, resident there, who we're financing half of his salary with. So he's working half time for us um, with this project to coordinate with UNESCO, getting their data, getting their inputs, uh, gathering information from them, um, connecting with cool people that knows a lot of stuff about it. Um, and we're, for, we're also working with an uh, organization called uh, Cultural Heritage Without Borders, which had a you know, kind of sim similar scope to UNESCO. Uh, they have local partners. Um, they're building up, you know, local networks about cu cultural heritage in a few countries, and uh, we've been, you know, tapping into that resource. And uh, we're also working with Wikimedia Italia uh, because they have had a few collections of uh, with the images from Syria, from Palmyra, and other parts of Syria that's now being destroyed. And uh, so they are. We're working together to upload that images and also to um, organize a photo exhibition. Um, these are the, like the seven things that we are working on, basically. Um, the first thing is that we're really trying to put a lot of effort into this product to inform the experts, the public, um, uh, you know, anyone that could be interested about the, you know, what, what is, uh, Wikimedia movement is doing together and how it affects them and what the benefits are with working together with us. And the second one is that we are transferring as much data as possible, uh, and that's not all data, but as much as possible from the Wikilabs Monument database into Wikidata. So we're now like in the process of, of structuring it uh, together with Sean Fred, um, and you know, getting, getting things in order there on with the Wikilabs Monument database, and then preparing for the uh, batch uploading data sets onto Wikidata. And that's something we're gonna focus a lot of our efforts on. Um, and uh, then we have um, the idea that even though we have all these 56 countries, that's not enough. So we want to, you know, continue branch out and talk to decision makers in around 10 other countries, so we can get their their collections of data and start processing that, getting it up there. You know, hopefully in, in close cooperation with local Wikimedians or local sh user groups or small chapters, um, but also in, in areas where there is no really like any local presence. Um, so we have made a we put in you know considerable effort to identify what kind of areas in the world that has most cultural heritage at risk that we should focus on, like designing a methodology around this, how to pick what countries to focus on, because we have limited resources, we have to prioritize. Um, so now when we've done that, we, we, when we have the data on Wikidata, then you can start doing really cool things. Um, but you know, to really make the data understandable and get mo more out of it, we want to connect it to more images. So we are working quite hard to find 
uh, partnerships with, uh, with different museums and climate institutions to digitize their, uh, like take the collections that they have from different countries of cultural heritage that are digitized and ba batch upload it onto Wikimedia Commons. Um, so we're aiming for around 100,000 photos there from them. And uh, then we have, um, um, you know, the next step, when we have these, all these images, we have all this data, we want to integrate it together. We want to, you know, improve the Wikipedia articles and we want to, you know, get this material to connect us. So we're going to do a bunch of events, both online and offline around this, um, hopefully in different countries uh, with GLAM experts and others to, you know, uh, make, contextualize the data, contextualize the images, uh, make it as useful as possible. And then we have, uh, like a photo, this, this, th when we have this data, we have this uh, information, we have the photos, um, we feel that we should probably, you know, try to show this to the world as well. You know, all this cool information and really important stuff that we have gathered. Um, so we want to do a photo exhibition. And that is the idea that it will take, you know, move around in three countries, uh, also international oriented thing. And we want to, you know, to highlight what the Wikimedia movement is doing. And finally, we are doing uh, some, you know, we're trying to fix some of the tools issues that Sean Fred was talking about. Um, we're going to try to look into how we can do statistics and other things. So just to get things, things rolling a little bit. You know, we're not expecting everything to be done uh, in 2017, but you know, it should be easier to continue with, the, with this kind of development. Um, yeah, so leaving on to Andre. Thanks. So, hello? Yeah. So, although projects like Connected Open Heritage and its predecessors have been very good at bringing content online, and we've brought enormous amounts of content online, the vast majority of basic information is still not accessible, globally speaking. So there's, there's still a lot we have to do there. And during this project, we've been identifying initiatives that are going on, and that we think will be important for the future, but we've also identified needs that we've encountered of things that are blocking this from, from going on. So we'll take a look at a few of those. So the first is tooling. So as we get more information and more content from third-party providers, such as GLAM institutions, their interest in getting feedback on what's being done with that content increases drastically. So for images, yes, we can get some basic statistics, but even there, we've only scratched the surface. And if we're looking at GLAM institutions contributing information to Wikidata, we don't even really know what we should measure. So tooling that makes it possible for these institutions and organizations themselves to easily find statistics, create reports, and visualizations is very important. And it's not only important, I'll rephrase that. Um, and it's important both for the organizations that aren't actually contributing information now, because it allows us to motivate them to do it and join this movement, but also for the uh, organizations that are contributing and are already convinced, they still need to justify why they're spending all of this effort on it to their governments, their boards, donors, etc. So the second big thing is integration to Wikipedia. So there are many new types of media and new types of information that's being created both by volunteers and that we're getting from GLAM organizations. But even when we can actually get information into Wikicommons, Wikimedia Commons or Wikidata, we still don't have the technical means or the social consensus for how this should be integrated into Wikipedia. And I think this is probably one of the like, main aspects that we need to, to prioritize as a movement to figure out how do we deal with all of this, this new media and stuff and integrate it into the platform where most of our visitors actually go to search for it. Uh, and that's followed by structured data on Wikimedia Commons. So all of these images being uploaded to Wikimedia Commons, again, either by the Glamour organizations or through Wikileaks Monuments connected to things that they care about, it's still fairly hard to find. I mean, we, most of us here knows how to find an image on Wikimedia Commons, but it's not as easy as Google. So figuring out how to find content and figuring out how to use that content in an easy but still correct way is, is a big thing. And yeah, structured metadata would make that a lot easier. I went the wrong way, sorry. And 
finally, so as, as chapters, as user groups, as thematic organizations and volunteers, we do a lot of cool things around cultural heritage preservation or making cultural heritage information available. And we've gotten quite good at actually telling each other what we've done. But we're still really bad at telling each other what we're doing and trying to get other people involved in what we're doing right now. And the big weakness there is that that does not enable us to, or then we're missing out on using Fight Art War, a truly global organization, a global movement. And we can get so much more done when we're pulling both these governments together or from two neighboring countries. If they're both asking for the same thing, and you sort of, they look over at each other and go, well, we're, they're sort of doing it. Why, why can't we? So there's a big thing that we're missing out there. And related to that is also then WMF's role. What, what role should they play in, in Glamworks and these collaborations? Which is a bigger question. But imagine we can overcome all of these challenges. And like, just let's look at the different opportunities and possibilities that are possible. So you already know that many of the organizations we've encountered through Connected Open Heritage, looking at 3D representations of their objects that they have in their collections or the sites that they're managing. And like, imagine you go to a Wikipedia article about an object that you're interested in, and you can study it, you can turn it, you can zoom in on it in a way that wouldn't actually be possible if you were at that museum that has it. And similarly, 360 panoramas, they're getting increasingly popular because they're getting increasingly cheaper and easy to create. So again, you go into an article about the monument, you can have a look around in this room, in this building, which you could possibly never enter, or it might actually have burnt down three years ago. Well, not if you want a good high quality panorama, but you know. <laughs> in three years, you'll see a good th thing from now. And we've also encountered organizations that are combining these two techniques, so you can actually sort of walk around inside their, the 3D structures of these buildings. And if you have something like that, then you're actually getting a different view than if you were actually po if it was actually possible for you to go there and visit it because you can get this sort of bird's eye view and you can understand it and put it in a different context and similarly many of the glam organizations are now getting used to using Wikidata, sharing their information there or having it shared there for them and then then they're asking themselves the question that Axel asked before but how how do we deal with the fact that it goes out of date so imagine that when when the national heritage board of sweden adds a new monument to their database, it goes pop. And in Wikidata, it pops up. When one burns down, sadly, you, you should find out about that on Wikidata as well. And by extension, in the articles, as soon as they realized that, oops. Um, so that's another very important thing that I think we need to think about. How, how do we keep this up to date as we're f currently just focusing on pushing in as much as possible? So, I'm going to wrap up by a with a quote from the Director General of the National Heritage Board, who said, the greatest threat towards the cultural heritage is the lack of knowledge and disinterest. The best way to protect that, the cultural heritage is therefore knowledge and information that's easy to find and free to use. Well, I had to use it. So with that, we open up to the questions. Thank you. Uh, and there's a microphone in the back, so raise your hand and it'll pass along to you. Uh, hi, my name is Peter Isotalo. I'm an uh, editor from Sweden. Uh, I mostly edit English Wikipedia and Wikisource, and I'm wondering um, the threats that you were talking about to monuments, what exactly are those threats and what are the most, like, the most pressing threats right now? Um, well, hello? Yeah. Uh, well, that's a really good question. Um, that doesn't have like a straight answer, I think, but a lot of cultural heritage is damaged simply because people doesn't know about it. Like, you know, they don't know that it's there, they don't know about the historical value. Um, you know, they build a new road through the forest and there ha happen to be a pile of stones there. 
you know, you remove the stones, and that was a grave, you know. Um, so I think that's happening everywhere all the time. Then of course you have like the direct threats that you know in certain parts of the world, cultural heritage is like destroyed in you know in the, as part of the conflict, you know as a part of removing the culture of the the opponent. Um, so that's a m major thing as well. But then you have like the the more instant happenings as well. You know in um, in countries where like earthquakes are very common, like take Chile or Nepal, recent examples. You know the cultural heritage is, is completely destroyed in certain areas. Yes, you know, like in a blink of an eye, really, or like in a short period of time at least. And, uh, you know, then you have to be proactive. You have to go there and take the photos beforehand and because you know that some areas are more prone to that kind of catastrophes. Or I was talking to a person from um, Bangladesh the other day and, you know, the areas are flooded all the time. Things are b getting destroyed every year, you know, when the, when the floods come. So it's, you know, we have to act now, not later, I think. Um. Just point, I'm going to paste it on the Etherpad. There's a great e essay on English Wikipedia made by Emilio, uh, who w was a contributor to Creative Monuments, called There is a Deadline. And it's basically giving lots of examples of cultural heritage that was destroyed by wars, by fire, by uh, thunderstorms, like you name it. So it, it, that, that basically answers your question in extensively. And the last one is, if, if you live in a city and you don't know that that old building is a monument, you don't care when the city goes, let's destroy that and build them all there. If you know about it, you care, and you might at least ask, why don't we build it next to it or somewhere else? Changing public opinion a little bit. What about another kind of threats? Legal threats. And particularly, I'm Vigneron from a bit of Wiki of Monument France when Jean Fred uh, needs a slave. <laughs> uh, and um, one week ago in France, we have um, a new law, and maybe you can't take any more picture of public domain monuments. Yeah, the building is still here, but hey, building, and nothing. So, um, and we know uh, obviously uh, freedom of panorama, another threat. So, do you do something? Is Dimitar here, maybe? I don't know. So first, I would say you get us beers tonight because you started the copyright discussion, and that, like, yeah, no. Um, <laughs> who wants to take it? I mean, um, we, we are doing, as part of the Connected Open Heritage Project, we are trying to look into these things a little bit, uh, prepare some, you know, like some brochures, some information material, um, some, um, we're, you know, looking into together with Big Media Germany, some of the legal issues. Um, you know, there are. There are a lot of things to do here. A lot of preparations need to be done, but we're trying. You know, we're trying to pr create some kind of like the basic stuff at least. So we have, because we are taking like that's part of the, you know, the process when we want to get data from decision makers. We have to explain what it's going to be used for, and we have to explain why it's relevant and why it's important. And uh, you know, and uh, part of that is taking the discussion about copyright, you know, freedom of panorama and other issues about database law. So it's because in some countries, you know, that's really tricky. We will not get their data. Or we cannot use it in, in a proper way if they don't have the you know the, the top level officials signing off on it. So. And again, awareness. If people around you don't know that this is happening, they don't care. If they feel that they're missing out on something, that's when they they take to the streets and and do it the French way. <laughs> okay. Um, do you think it's doable to uh, integrate other cultural heritage, like immaterial cultural heritage, like languages? Um, so there's other uh, cultural heritage, like uh, languages, uh, dances, and this kind of of things can be data too. And do you think it's possible to integrate this in at some point? So you're you're talking about the immaterial cultural heritage. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, uh, when, when you design a product, you have to have some kind of a, a scope of it to make it feasible. And, and this is already like a very big, wide, you know, product where we're trying to squeeze in a lot of things. So we decided we're going to go for the cultural her heritage, the immovable cultural heritage, you know, like buildings and that kind of things. Um, I mean, a lot of the, the things we're putting in place will hopefully also work, you know, be able to possible to use you know like for that kind of you know if if they have a data if if the state has a database of uh, 
all the, um, I don't know, the minority, minority languages, yes, for example. And, you know, they have a, um, a lexicon from them. You know, if we are taking discussion about database legislation and how the, the state are, should, you know, could think about that, you know, then that will help that work as well later on, hopefully, but it's not something we're focusing on right now. I would just tie to the question Philip asked earlier about, oh, if you're not talking about monuments, or food, like whatever, well, if you're into that, well, I, I know, for example, that John Cummings at UNESCO is doing a lot on, on minority languages and endangered languages, so it's possible. And if you want to document dance, well, I, I, I know this, uh, in Switzerland, they did that a couple of years ago, they wanted to document the, um, uh, they have 30 traditions or something like that in, in Switzerland. They wanted to document all of them using videos and stuff. And, and yeah, that, that could be the next volume. We could ask monuments. Don't take pictures of monuments. That's like uh, so 2012. Like, just make movies of people dancing in folk songs. That that totally be a project. Yeah. Oh. Oh. I would like to comment on this. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I would like to tell that uh, in Finland, the National <coughs> Board of Antiquities uh, did a local uh, listing for the inter um, intangible heritage uh, listing <laughs> together with Wikimedia Finland. And it is a wiki. And so it's an, an interesting new form of collaboration that has been started perhaps quite quietly so far. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for that great introduction. I think it's a very, very exciting and challenging program you're going to have. And I was missing a little information for how long is the program scheduled? Is it a year? Is it two years, five years, ten years? Uh, you mean Connected Open Heritage? Uh, Connected Open Heritage will last until mid-2017. Mid That's why we have the project ending. Okay, of that, course that's we, of course not we very much time. Is there an option to prolong it? Well, I mean, like, we, we will, of course, look for continuous funding from different sources, but, yeah, it's, it's one year left. Now we've done a lot of the, yeah, look, you know, the basic work, I think, the last few months. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello. I'm Esther from Amical Wikimedia, and I was wondering regarding the future of the Connected Open Heritage Project. There's this uh, Institute for Digital Archaeology. It's a joint venture uh, between, I think, Harvard and Oxford universities, and they're actually doing um, 3D uh, photography and, and well, they, they can rebuild, I mean, destroyed uh, archaeological sites and things like this. And I, I think they are working with open licenses, and I, I think that it will be a, an awesome uh, idea to contact with them and try to partner up. So uh, just in case you didn't know them, so it's the Institute for Digital Archaeology. I think it's a nice door to knock. Thank you for the suggestion. So on the slide that I never showed, I think, there's actually the link to the meta page for the Connected Open Heritage Project. And if you go there, we're extremely happy to take all recommendations, suggestions, tips about other people doing similar things. So, sorry for not showing that slide. It's on Meta. Yeah. Yeah, Hi, I'm Christian. I'm the national coordinator for Wikilos Monuments here in Italy. So, I have, so we have problems, you know, by legislation. We have the same, the same problem like France. Not, not the same, but okay, <laughs> some kind of problems. So, um, I'm, what I want to say is not that I'm afraid of the, from, for the, the death of Wikilos Monument. That's not what we said, but, uh, you know, there are st states like Austria that uh, just reach the, reach the target. But, um, and, I, and I know that there are a lot of problems also for, uh, because uh, you when a contest uh, lasts uh, a lot of years, uh, can be less people uh, or some uh, institution can get bored about helping us and so on. But for example, we, we need ULM to, the, uh, to fight against this uh, legislation. We need to continue with Wikilos monuments until 
we reach the, that target. And then I don't know what will happen. So um, I'm curious about, uh, uh, yes, like Philippe said, what's the role, what will be the role for, we, for, the, found, for the foundation, what will be the, the role for other chapters, because if uh, in two, three years, uh, we remain only Italy, France, uh, or Greece uh, to have Wikileaks monuments, it, you know. So, sorry for uh, uh, these confusing uh, questions, but it's just to, to put mean, also the Italian uh, way uh, for Wikileaks. Yeah, monuments. I mean, the, the first point you pointed out is like, you're, tr you're using Wikileaks monuments to fight leg legislation in your country, but when you get to the point where you have freedom of panorama, that's where you can actually start Wikileaks monuments. Yeah. Because then you can actually do everything. And um, I'm sure like, countries like Germany and France uh, will be doing this for a very long time, just because they have a lot of monuments and there's still a lot to do. Mm -hmm. But it really depends on if the chapters can like, uh, find the budget to contribute to the international effort, basically. I mean, we have, do have people here from Wikimedia Germany and uh, from the foundation, I think? Do we? Or not? I don't know. Maybe they can comment on, on that situation. Hi, um, Alex Denson. I'm the uh, Glam Wiki strategist at the foundation, and I just got hired into this role in the last two months. Um, so the foundation has not known about the stakeholder group uh, for a while. Like there haven't been people at the foundation who have connections to this cultural heritage preservation activity. Um, and you know, it's part of the reason these, these priorities haven't been advocated, uh, advocated for for a long while is because there's just not that connection. Now you have a connection, um, but I also need a story. I, I need a story from the collective community like why this matters strategically for the movement. Um, and that story needs to be collated and there needs to be support. Um, because without that, we can't talk to the board or we can't imagine new ways to use our engineering resources um, as a collective, right? And so I, I think like the work Sweden's doing is really foundational to this, but there, there needs to be a consensus too, right? That consensus needs to be overwhelming and it needs to be communicated. Um, and that, you know, once that's there, it's much easier to have those conversations internally um, and with our board. And so I, I think that's, it would be useful uh, from kind of, if we think about strategy, right? Um, and that's hard because a lot of us have our projects in our local context. And that's where a lot of our energy goes. So it's, you know, the chapters that have a vested interest in this, can organize this conversation, and I, I will bring people to it. I <laughs> um, but we need to have it. Well, the only question is, where do we start this conversation, and who's going to drive that conversation? I have a follow-up. Um, my name is Leila. I'm from Wikimedia Foundation's research team. Uh, my comments here are more on the volunteer capacity. I organized Wiki Loves Monument for Iran last year um, with the help of Roman. Um, and um, it, it was a very inspiring experience. It was also something that helped me to realize how lonely the interna in international team was. And that was very helpful um, to see and kind of experience. Um, so I signed up this year to help with the coordination on the international team as a volunteer. I'm still organizing Wiki Loves Monument for Iran, and hopefully more people from Iran will be helping this year. Um, I, I do believe, as a person who has been in the foundation, I, 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 I hear what Alex says. So the message from the community needs to be clear. And now I'm wearing this double hat. So maybe we can uh, use this opportunity and uh, work with me as a, as a volunteer in my volunteer time and kind of try to define a, a strategic direction for Wiki Loves Monument so that uh, it can help us move forward. Uh, I already had some discussions with Ilario and Roman about this. And uh, one of the goals that we have for this year is to increase the number of uh, new countries who participated in Wiki Loves Monument. So we have a goal of at least adding five new countries. Um, that probably helps. But still, the Wiki Loves Monument and potentially Glam community, extended community, should come together and help us create a signal, a clear signal for the foundation so that they can help. 
And if your country has never participated in Wikilove's monument, please come and talk to me after this. Also, another thing you can put on the Etherpad. Thank you, guys. <laughs>